Hello everyone, welcome to Think Like Toppers Daily Current Affairs of the Hindu News Analysis. So myself Girish and let's see the news of 24th of December 2023 that is the Sunday paper which is very very important. The first news is the Supreme Court has told that the tribunals cannot direct the government to frame the policies. That is, the Supreme Court has clarified that the tribunals functioning under strict parameters of their governing legislation cannot direct the government to make the policies. Further, the tribunal is also a quasi-judicial body functioning within the parameters set out in the government legislation and it cannot direct those responsible for policy making. So that's the highlight of the verdict. So from the UPSC perspective, the quasi-judicial body, this is a direct topic which is mentioned in the syllabus of GS paper 2. So tribunals are the quasi-judicial bodies which was constituted under 46th Constitutional Amendment Act of 1976 and under the Article 323A and 323B. Article 323A deals with the administrative tribunals where only the central government is empowered to constitute such tribunals. Whereas Article 323B deals with other purpose tribunals where both center and states are empowered to constitute the tribunals. So with constituting the tribunals, the hierarchy of the judiciary comes like this, where the subordinate court lies at the bottom, up comes the high, high courts and at the top the supreme courts. The tribunals are just running the parallel to the high courts and tribunals have two levels with regard to the tribunals and the appellate tribunals. And this particular verdict upholds the principle of separation of powers, which is a basic structure doctrine as per the Indian constitution, which has been upheld by the Supreme Court in various instances. The appointments to the tribunals are done by the central governments. For example, the tribunals are established under the required laws. For example, the Companies Act constitutes the National Company Law Tribunal and the National Company Law Appellate Tribunals. Moving on further to the next news, we have the issue of Maratha Reservation, which has been going on in Maharashtra for a, quite a long time since four to five years back. And the genesis dates back to very long time. So the State Backward Commission has been gathered the empirical data at a large scale on Maratha community and its plight. The observations of the Supreme Court while it struck down the reservation will be taken into cognizance while gathering the empirical data about the Maratha community. This is the present update which has been given by the Maratha, uh, Maharashtra state government. So when we look into the Maharashtra, Ma, when we look into the Maratha reservation issues the marathas are one of the most strongest communities in maharashtra and they make up to 33 percent of the state's population supreme court in 2021 it struck down the maratha reservation law which was passed by the state legislature and it cited that the breach of 50 percent cap of the reservation which was held in indira sani case as the reason for striking down that particular law and when the Maratha reservation was treated as a separate treatment to the particular community it violated article 14 and article 21 that is right to equality and right to life and liberty of Indian constitution furthermore when the supreme court in upheld the 102nd constitutional amendment that it recognized the constitutional status for the National Commission for the Backward Classes. 
so it also held in the judgment that the states cannot change the central obc list which has to be done only by the president of india but the states can have only the recommending powers when it comes to or uh, uh, when it comes to any changes to the central obc list further there was a news with regard to arunachal pradesh uh, traditions that uh, with regard to hunting practices which has been going on in arunachal pradesh as part of the tradition of many of the tribes so hunting is a tradition as many among the 140 tribes and sub tribes across 83 square kilometers of the state about 80% of the area of the state the state government has appealed to these tribe communities to give up the air guns to give up the air guns with regard to conservation of the diminishing flora and fauna because with usage of the air guns there was about more than 200 animals in a day that could be hunted by these tribes as part of their tradition and these traditions cannot be stopped by law or by force these are the traditional customs which has came through centuries and age old practices hence the state government came up with a very unique and peaceful initiative like anti air gun initiative where the state government encouraged usage of bows and arrows as a primitive weapons which really reduced the number of hunting activities which really reduced the hunting activities by these tribes so hence this has been led to the revival of the diminishing flora and fauna in arunachal pradesh this can be one of the examples for the mains perspective examples for the peaceful initiative between the state governments and the traditional groups in northeast and coming further there is a news with regard to west bengal that is the cash transfers in bengal has led to increase in financial decisions taken by the women a study by a private ngo has said so that means a study by the amartya sen's pratichi trust the lakshmir bandar one of the flagship schemes of west bengal government puts out the cash incentives have increased the women's beneficiaries abilities to make financial decisions and position in the family but the larger issues of gender discrimination the child marriages and the domestic violence still prevails however these flagship schemes has made betterment in the women's financial decisions in recent days the study published recently pointed out that 85.55% of the women reported that they decide how to spend the money themselves followed by a joint decision with their husbands so lakshmir bandar flagship program is a financial assistance as said before uh, where 1000 rupees cash incentives has been given monthly to scst women and 500 to other categories between the age of 25 to 60 and this applies to only women that is more important so however this a uh, flagship scheme has increased the financial decision which is a way for women empowerment and this could be one of the examples for the mains answer writings with regard to any questions uh, pertaining to women empowerment which can arise in gs paper 1 and 2 for the let us look into the uh faq section of the hindu newspaper which is very important where detailed analysis of the any current issues which is going on will be given so this week there is a critical analysis about the recently passed telecommunications bill in the parliament 
so let us look into the this how does the government plan to consolidate the law for wireless networks and internet service providers has the licensing procedure been eased for telecom operators what are the industry players saying and what are the concerns raised by digital groups these are the key questions which has been addressed in this particular article so let us read the article first the telecommunications bill 2023 was passed in parliament this week and this has replaced three archaic laws of the colonial era that is the telegraph act of 1885 the indian wireless telegraphy act of 1933 the telegraph wires unlawful position act of 1950 so this particular new law telecommunications bill aims to consolidate the laws for wireless networks and internet service providers and simplify the procedure process of application for licenses and per permits for telecom operators further let us know what is telecommunications bill 2023 first this bill governs the authorization of the telecommunications network and services this bill governs the authorization of telecommunications network and services provides for auctioning as well as administrative allocation of spectrum and it defines the mechanism for exercising the right of way for laying telecom infrastructure such as cables in public as well as private property it also spells out emergency measures the government can take in the interest of national security public safety such as intercept the messages suspend telecommunication services as well as take temporary possession of any telecommunication services or network so the bill also states that the rules formed to protect the consumers with setting up of a do not disturb register to ensure that they don't receive any specific class of messages without prior consent further the bill also governs the host of services like the ott services with regard to whatsapp telegram email services like gmail through broad definitions for telecommunications so the messages by wire radio optical or other electromagnetic systems whether or not such messages have been subjected to rearrangement computation or other processes by any means in the course of the transmission emission or reception so the bill also marks a shift from the licensing regime to the authorization regime that means that the telecommunications services in india shall obtain a authorization from the central government subject to such terms and conditions including fees and charges as may be prescribed so any who offers a service without such kind of authorization can face imprisonment up to 3 years and fine up to 2 crores further the bill allows the government to assign the spectrum for telecommunication through auction except for entities listed in the first schedule for which assignment will be done by the administrative process the first schedule includes the entities engaged in national security defense law enforcement crime prevention public broadcasting services etc so let us look into the concerns which has been arise from this bill the critics say that this particular telecommunications bill of 2023 is draconian which provides a legal architecture for mass surveillance and internet shutdowns so mass surveillance and internet shutdowns are really unconstitutional when it is done as part of the deliberate surveillance means to surveil the citizens of the country because internet has been held as one of the key fundamental rights in many of the judgments by the supreme court however the government is also empowered to intercept the messages of the citizens in the name of the national security 
So among its several contentious clauses in the requirement that all users have to be identified through use of verifiable biometric based identification as may be prescribed by telecommunication service providers. Further, it requires no user shall furnish any false particulars or suppress material information. This could impede the whistleblowers and the journalists who are operate under anonymity. Hence, this can bully the ind independent journalists who work on YouTube, for example. Okay. So, if the users fail to comply to these provisions, they can be fined heftily with up to 25,000 to 1 lakh rupees. Further, the contentious provisions are contained in Chapter 4 of the Telecommunications Bill, which grants the emergency powers of the to the central government in the interest of public safety and national security. So the controversy here arises when we cite the incidents of the Pegasus issue which had been the havoc in the parliament recently where the uh, particular spyware was implanted in the mo uh, mobiles of many uh, elite persons to be said as the opposition leaders like Rahul Gandhi etc. So further the bill also allows the central and the state governments during the public emergency like disaster management and in the interest of public safety to take temporary possession of any telecommunication services or the network and it can take control of the management of services and networks it preventing the incitement of commission of any offenses that means for example the uh, prolonged internet shutdowns like in Manipur and Jammu Kashmir however on the other side of the bill uh, the Digital Infrastructure Providers Association and Cellular Operators Association has welcomed the provisions of the bill where it intends to bring the uniformity across the states in terms of the right of way and rules and regulations that is the licensing regulations. So this bill also addresses the long standing issues of the telecom infrastructure including capping of charges and deployment, tele deployment of the telecom infrastructure on private property. So the telecom network is not considered part of the property for transactions or tax purposes since the bill is also welcomed for providing relief to the infrastructure industry from any additional exorbitant tax burdens. So these are the positive sides of the bill. Further, the Indian Space Association has also thanked the government where the bill has opened the space for satellite based service provision like for example Starlink from SpaceX Elon Musk. So the Internet Freedom Foundation and the Internet Press Institute have written to the telecom minister uh, raising the concerns with regard to the interception of the messages that will enable indiscriminate surveillance and weaken the online safety. That's the key concern of the bill. The authority to suspend the internet has been granted without dwelling over the procedural safeguards which has been put forth by the Supreme Court. So these are the key critics and key positive advantages of the telecommunications bill which has been passed in recent parliament session. So coming to the next FAQ, the article deals with the latest blip in the India and Maldives ties. So we all know that the Maldives has elected a new president uh, by name Mohammed Muzu. So recently he has been in news as uh, a proponent of the India Out campaign who has been supported by the Abdullah Yamin who was a uh, anti-India face previously. So this article dwells about those issues like why has the government of Mohammed Mizu decided against renewing a hydrographic survey agree agreement with India and what are its implications uh, coming soon after the pledge to send back Indian troops stationed in the Indian Ocean archipelago. So 
when we read this article so maldives cabinet decided to renewing a uh, mou with india for cooperation in hydrography the agreement was signed in 2019 which was due to expire in 2024 that is the coming year however the newly elected president has terminated this mou prematurely in 2023 itself uh, currently stationed in indian ocean archipelago the indian troops have been sent back and this move was yet another indication of his government's intention to reverse the a uh, previous president that is ibrahim solis administrations of india first policies to be overturned so let us see what is hydrography is so hydrography is the science of studying oceans seas and other water bodies by compiling and analyzing the data maps and charts so branching off from the applied sciences it looks at measuring and describing the physical attributes of the water bodies and predicting how they might change over time so this primarily for the safety of the navigation it also supports other activities such as economic development security defense scientific research environmental protection so hydrographical measurements also includes tidal currents and wave information do india has any expertise in this field so for that the answer is here india has been an active member of international hydrographic organization international hydrographic organization so india has been member to this particular institution since 1955 so as keen upsc aspirants you have to go to google and just type what is international hydrographic organization and you have to search for the information and just take one or two points which are basic to this organization because such kind of statements can appear in prelims exams so that is where we have to be very careful while reading such kind of articles and further the indian naval hydrographic department the inhd which has been in uh, established in 1874 in kolkata so this has been the nodal agency for hydrographic surveys and has a fleet of indigenously built modern survey ships india has partners with many countries with regard to hydrography like with the beat the african countries or the east asian countries for example the mauritius seychelles vietnam myanmar kenya so its growing potential as a force multiplier is undisputed when it comes to hydrography or the maritime diplomacy so why this 2019 mou has been significant for india because this particular mou is a face of india maldives maritime security and the defense partnership which is very very key for peaceful indo pacific policy of india so indian navy has carried out three joint hydrographic surveys in 21 22 and 2023 so let us look into the issue why the cabinet of maldivian government has terminated this so the current administration's pledge to terminate all the ag- agreements with foreign parties that are detrimental or to endanger the national security of the maldives this is the generic reason which has been given by the maldivian government as of now and it is in the best interest of the maldivian sovereignty that this capacity is improved within our own military entrusting them with the responsibility of surveilling and policing our waters and excluding the participation of any foreign party that means the maldivian government the present maldivian government is not interested in engaging with any of the foreign players where it threatens its own sovereign powers or the national security how the india has responded is india has been very pragmatic in its response that it has not either criticized or nor 
welcome the move by the Maldives. So what does this mean for India and Maldives ties in the future? However, these uh, repercussions can be said to be specific. These kind of uh, negative repercussions after elections of uh, Mohammed Muzu indicates that India has to be very pragmatic with regard to the archipelago in the future coming days where the present president has been the face of India out campaign and his vice president has, was present in China's uh, Indo-Pacific region forum where he opined that uh, very eagerness to engage with China for any of the further collaborations. So this clearly gives the space for Chinese presence in the Indian Ocean, which is not very good for India's policies in the future. So further, when we look into the next news, so there is a news with regard to uh, the Houthi attacks. The Houthi rebellions are based in not Lebanon, sorry, the Houthi rebels are based in Yemen, whereas Hezbollah, the Hezbollahs are based in Lebanon, whereas the Hamas, they are based in Gaza. So these kind how this right yes so these kind of questions can be arised in the match the following kind of questions in prelims so at that point of time we can get confused and lose some marks so please be very careful which rebellion group is based where that is more important that's very simple so when we read two to three articles repetitively based on those rebellion groups so it just stuck to our mind so let's dig into the article now so there is a strategic choke point that's the headlines how this attack on the tankers passing through the narrow strait has disrupted one of the busiest global shipping lanes dragging us deeper into the conflict which conflict the ongoing Israel Hamas conflict so this repercussion has been spread to Yemen now because the Houthi rebels are in solidarity with the Gazans they are all upset with the US's decision to support Israel's bombing on Gaza Strip indiscriminately so when Israel Hamas war broke out on October 7, many feared that the Hezbollah group, which is a Shia militia group based in Lebanon, would escalate this war. But the Lebanese Israel border remained tense, and since the occasional flare ups, both the Hezbollah and the Israel have been careful not to trigger the all out war. They stayed fo focused on Gaza, one of the most intense aerial ground campaigns in recent histories. So these non-state actors had widened the conflict, turning the Red Sea into the battlefield. When these, the for example, the Ansar Allah of Yemen. Ansar Allah means it is the parent name for the Houthi rebels. So the Houthi leaders like Badr al-Din al-Houthi and Hussein al-Houthi, they first declared war against Israel in solidarity with the Palestinians. They fired drones, ballistic missiles towards Israel. And these were shot down by the Israel missiles or the US warships. So when this plan was failed, the Houthis turned their face towards the they turned their face towards blocking the straight in the red sea which straight is that which is very very important and that is the strait of bab el mandab this links red sea with gulf of aden and indian ocean that is here this is a narrow strip of just 29 kilometers 
this strait of bab el mandab this connects with red sea and gulf of aden and this further opens up to the indian ocean and arabian sea this narrow strip has been taken control by the houthi rebels they have been in control uh, recently they have been bombing the cargo ships which has been passing through this strait nearly 12% of the global shipping occur through this strait since their attack there is a drop off nearly one third nearly one third traffic has been dropped in this very busy route many uh, big companies like uh, for example mersic they have reduced the shipping route through this the babel manda which is just 29 kilometers wide and its narrowest point is a strategically important strait given its location so this separates the arabian peninsula from east africa the red sea opens into the gulf of aden which joins the arabian sea and then the indian ocean so here from the prelims point of view the word bab el the strait of bab el mandeb and its location is very very important from the prelims point of view because this can be a geography location based question so i think that's all for now to for today 24 december so if you like the video please like share and subscribe to my youtube channel think like toppers for further any of the similar context stay tuned and stay subscribed thank you